The night Jesus is arrested to be tortured and executed, he first celebrates the Last Supper with his disciples. That's where he introduces communion. Then he says, guys, let's go on a walk. He starts talking to them as they're walking. He knows it's just hours until he is arrested, beaten, tortured, and executed. He knows his disciples will be filled with confusion, despair, questions. He knows he will rise from the grave. He's tried to tell them this multiple times, but even after that, he will ascend to heaven and leave them with the mission of spreading the good news of God's endless love to the world. There will be persecution, there will be plagues, there will be war, there will be ethnic problems as they assimilate both Jew and Gentile into the church. So there will be struggle, there will be challenges, there will be confusion. So Jesus has to be thinking, what do I say to prepare these guys for what's ahead? What can I say that they will remember, that will help them persevere? As they're walking, they eventually come to the Garden of Gethsemane. But as they go, they pass vineyards, some of which have been around for generations. And as a master teacher, Jesus does what he often does. He uses the power of metaphor. But in this case, he specifically uses a type of metaphor called a controlling metaphor. And what a controlling metaphor is, is a metaphor that can be looked at from multiple different angles, all to reveal the same main truth. So in his most famous sermon, he tells his followers, you are a city on a hill. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. It's a controlling metaphor. So as he thinks of what's ahead and he's passing these ancient vineyards, he looks at his closest followers and he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. I'm the vine, you're the branches. I'm the vine, you are the branches. And what Jesus does is he emphasizes connection over production. He emphasizes connection over production. Here's the way my friend Kyle says this. He says, be the branch, be the branch. I don't have to be the vine. I don't have to focus on production. I just have to focus on the connection. I just have to be the branch and then Jesus will work everything out through me. See, what I often ask is, how do I produce? How do I create? And ultimately beneath that is, do I have what it takes? I told this story, I don't know, several years ago now, uh, that I half regret sharing if it wasn't good to be vulnerable because it was about our kitchen table. And I told this story of how we had this nice kitchen table and I wanted to do this DIY epoxy glaze on top of it, but it was right before we were leaving for vacation and I messed up the DIY project. And then we got in the car for what should have been a three hour ride and it turned into an eight hour ride and it resulted in a horrible fight where my wife was in the car ride buying me a train ticket home because she didn't want to be around me. But what happens now is people come over to our house, they sit down for dinner and they get their eyes wide, their jaw drops and they say, is this the table? And we're kind of like eating our broccoli and chicken and we say, what are you talking about? They say, you know, the epic fight table. And my wife is like, yes, this is the table. And her tone kind of communicates, thank you, honey, for sharing that to hundreds of people. But the genesis of that story was really the question, do I have what it takes? Can I produce? Can I make something happen on my own? And what I wasn't doing in that situation is focusing on connection over production. I wasn't focused on Carl, just be the branch. When I focus on production, over connection, I carry a weight I wasn't meant to carry. I hope a couple months ago you saw the interview we did when we were talking about anxiety with a professional Christian counselor. We talked about how we cope in this COVID world in which we find ourselves. And the biggest learning I had from that was that this revealed not that we lost control, but how little control we actually had 
in the first place. We had an extended conversation about it. In fact, we posted the full interview on YouTube if you haven't seen that. But it was very challenging as he leaned into me, as he leaned into us to say, hey, what can you really control? What can you really focus on? I don't know if you're like me, I'm like a person who likes to produce. I'm a person who likes to do, who likes to accomplish. And this season is teaching us that's not what you can do. That's not what you could do beforehand, even though that's the facade that you existed in. So one thing I've been challenging people in this time is whenever this season ends, come out on the other side of this with a stronger relationship with Christ. You can't produce, you can't do, but you can be the branch. You can, foc you can focus on connection over production. So I'll just, even though it doesn't seem like that big a deal, I'll tell you one little way I've been trying to live this out is with this little journal here. Every day for a long time, I've tried to begin my day with the 3G prayer, talking about what I'm grateful for, what I need grace for, and my God-driven goals for that day. And so during this lockdown COVID season, I've said, I think I can take this to another level of focus um, and intentionality by writing it down. So this is what I write down. It's not really that much, but I was thankful for the other day that I shot a near record golf score. I was thankful that I got to go to a friend's pool. I was thankful um, that I had a 90 minute workout. That same day I said, God, I need grace because I really lost control of my temper with my kids. And I said, God, here's my goals. I wanna run today. I need to finish a sermon I'm working on and I just wanna read one chapter of one of the books I'm reading and I prayed over it, I shut my journal and I went on. And I know that's not that big a deal, but it's one thing I'm trying to do to leave this time with a stronger relationship with God, focusing on connection over production. I think this applies to us as a church as well, that as a church, we need to be the branch. Last year, I told you all how um, there's this company, and it sounds a little weird, but there's probably things in your industry that do the same thing. They come up with a list of the 100 fastest growing churches in the country every year. And in 2019, Mosaic made that list, and it was really exciting, really cool. I look up to those churches just as people I can learn from, as resources to help me. And if you had asked me last year, how did Mosaic get on that list? I would say, well, it was really the work of 10 years of grinding, of 10 years of saying come and see and 10 years of sacrificial generosity and 10, year, 10 years of hardcore serving and just 10 years of doing our duty week in, week out, day in, day out, and seeing the fruit of what happened as a result of that. But I was talking with Kyle, who helped me um, kind of structure this message a little bit back in February, and he pastors one of the biggest churches in the entire country, thousands and thousands of people, it's crazy. He was telling me how that a couple years ago, he was on some pastor's podcast and the guy said, Kyle, why does your church consistently grow year after year after year to be so large and continue to grow? And on the podcast, Kyle's sitting in front of the microphone with his headphones on and he says, well, we, and then he paused. And he said it was like the Holy Spirit kind of nudged him and said, um, excuse me, we? It was, it was a moment where God was kind of saying to him, uh, Kyle, we didn't build this church. Kyle, I <laughs> built this church. And Kyle, I can continue to build this church with or without you. But if you think anything is we, just jump off the train because it's I. Bottom line, Kyle, focus on connection, not production. Kyle, you just be the branch. It reminded me of a story in the Old Testament that I've come to understand, I think, in a deeper, fuller way recently. It's kind of a weird story. If you've been familiar with the Bible a while, you may know it. It's when Moses has led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt on their way to the Promised Land. And on their way, they have to go through the desert. And so there's no water there, there's no food, and God has to provide for them in miraculous ways. But early on in their journey, they get thirsty. They say, Moses, give us some water, we're gonna die. So Moses cries out to God and God says, hey, uh, 
hit this rock and it'll provide some water. Weird story, but it happens and God provides some water. Well, later on, they're journeying at a different place. They're thirsty again, they complain. And this time God says something slightly different. He says, Moses, speak to this rock and it will provide water for the people to drink. But Moses is angry and he hits the rock and he says, do we have to provide water for you? And water comes out. But God says, hey, Moses, since you disobey me, your life's mission to get these people to the promise saying, yeah, you're not going in. They're all going, but not you. And my whole life, because I've read that story from a young age, I've thought, oh, it's because God said, speak to the rock, and Moses hit the rock. And then that would kind of make me feel uncomfortable because it's like, wow, that's a pretty drastic punishment for just hitting instead of speaking. I mean, the end result is they think God performed a miracle for them. So like, what's the big deal? Like, seems like God was having a bad day and he completely cuts Moses out of this huge promise and big blessing just because he hit the rock instead of spoke the rock. But if you read the story more closely, here's what I've noticed. Is Moses says, must we provide you water? It's not, God's going to provide you water. Must we do this? And I thought, there's that word, (laughs) we. So God stopped Kyle when he said we. God punished Moses when he said we. And I thought that was all interesting enough. But then this year, we got notified that once again, Mosaic is one of the 100 fastest growing churches in the entire country. I was really excited by that. It's a huge honor. Then the magazine that puts together that list reached out to us to interview me. And no lie, the first question the woman asked on the phone was, why did Mosaic grow so much this past year? And I thought of that Star Wars meme. It's a trap, right? So I was very careful in my response. I said, we messed up a whole lot this year and I don't know what we did. And she said, well, what'd you mess up? I said, well, we spent more money, time and energy on Christmas than ever before, but it was our first Christmas that didn't have a record of Christmas attendance. We are good at this thing called Impact Week, but we just really struggled to figure out how to mobilize our entire church to serve the rest of the year. We have some amazing middle and high schoolers who are eager to change the world and grow and figure out how God can improve their relationships, but we have struggled up to this point to find a student minister who can lead them and take them to the next level. So I tried to give her example after example of things where we fall short and we've messed up. And she was kind of confused and said, well, how did Mosaic grow this year? And I said, well, we got lucky. We were blessed by God. And I was reminded of this verse, I'm the vine, you're the branches. I'm the vine, you're the branches. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Jesus starts out this whole little section by saying, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. And that word true means that there's false vines out there that we could run to. On this tree right here, this is what's called an invasive vine because there are some vines that give life and there are some vines that literally suck life. And if no one takes this vine off of this tree, it will literally kill the tree because it is taking the nutrients that this tree should be dependent on. I wonder if you've ever run to a false vine. Maybe your spouse is a false vine where you don't simply love your spouse and honor your spouse. You are dependent on your spouse. And if, when they let you down, it's not just that they let you down, it's that they were your source of strength and now your world is over. For some people, their kids are their vine. And listen, when they're first born, that's easy because they are cute and innocent and beautiful and your world is rocked and it's absolutely amazing, but they grow up and they rebel and they sin and maybe in some cases they even walk away from you. And if that happens, I'm not saying that would not really, really hurt. But if your kids are your vine, that'll crush you. 
Maybe you've tried to be the vine for someone else and you get the satisfaction from knowing they depend on you for everything and that can only last so long. Jesus says, be the branch, be the branch. And if I can just take it one step farther, this is why a lot of people and maybe even you are ready to give their lives to Christ. Because they say, I tried other vines and it didn't work. I thought it was going to produce fruit in me, produce the fruit of the life I wanted. But all it did at the end of the day was suck life out of me and I'm withered and I'm dry and I need something to give me life. And if that's you, you should give your life to Christ. Because again, he says, I am the true grapevine. Jesus tells his followers, anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. And I think his use of the word branch there is pretty generous because if you're disconnected from the vine, if you're cut off from the vine, you're not a branch. You're a stick. <laughs> but somehow, be the stick just doesn't have a good ring to it, does it? I attached some plastic fruit to this because I think if you're just a stick, that's what you got to do, I guess, because you're not going to have fruit any other way. And from afar, this can actually maybe look good. Maybe from afar, it looks authentic. Maybe from afar, it looks like something you'd want to eat. But if you got close enough and tried to take a bite of this, I think you'd say, no thanks, nothing to see here. But I wonder if this represents a lot of us. And maybe you would say, well, I got a mosaic sticker on my car, or, or I click and see every week, or, or I've got a favorite worship song. But there's no real fruit. There's no real life. Nothing's happening. And here's the thing. If you offer someone this, a fake fruit, and later they get an opportunity to taste real fruit, they're going to have been deceived and say, no thanks, I tried that once. I don't want any. Listen to what Jesus says, starting in verse 9. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I've loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you're my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, love each other. See, in the section of scripture, in the first 11 verses, 11 different times, Jesus says, remain in me, remain in me, remain in me, be the branch. And the result, he says, is when you be the branch, the result is love of other people. John says it this way, we love because he first loved us. See, I was lost, I was broken, I was alone, I was dead in my sin, but Jesus came on a search and rescue mission for me to save me. And I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. There's nothing I can do to lose it. I just have to be the branch. And when I focus on being the branch, the result is loving others. I love hearing stories of how our church loves well. I love the story of the woman who wanted to be a voice of hope in these times and got together a group of women, about half of them were white, about half of them were black, and about half of the whole group is related to police officers somehow and they had a conversation of how to move forward together. 
I love hearing the story of the guy who saw us give a check for $10,000 to 1012 Sports, and he said, that's great that my tithe is going there, but I also want my time to go there. So he signed up to start serving in the city with them, being the branch. I love the story of the mom who, when she found out the news of no in-person school for the next however many months, she was immediately overwhelmed and thinking, I got to manage my kids during the day. I have a job and this is an addition to everything else. What am I going to do? And then she just remembered, just be the branch. That's how I'll serve everybody. I love the story of the guys who were using each other's time and skills to fix up each other's houses. And they said, hey, why don't we just make this our ministry? And now they seek out people who wouldn't otherwise have house projects done. They help a woman whose husband is deployed and a single mom and a newly divorced woman who otherwise would have lingering problems in their house, but they took care of it being the branch. I love hearing about the family that had pursued foster care, kind of put things on hold when the rest of the world got pushed on. Uh, put on hold and they said you know what this isn't a time to push pause for us either there are children out there who need a loving home let's take the next step and let's not wait let's be the branch how are those people doing that they're not simply working themselves to exhaustion trying to manufacture that and if they are it won't last what they've discovered is this I'm the vine you're the branch you Jesus says, be the branch. I wonder if you've settled for this and Jesus wants to give you this. That's what he offers you. You just be the branch. And the thing Jesus gives us to remind us of that, that there's nothing we manufacture or try to do is communion. This whole conversation where Jesus says, be the branch, begins with him instituting communion, saying, you're not going to understand everything that happens. I can't give you all the answers right now, but I am going to do something that will set you free. And it is not conditional on who you are, what you say, what you've done, or anything you will do. So I want you to go ahead and grab your bread and wine or whatever you have where you're watching to celebrate communion. I have bread and wine. First time I've celebrated communion in a vineyard before. But go ahead and take that bread, eat that, and remember that Jesus' body was given for you. And then as you drink your wine, grape juice, whatever you've got, be reminded that unconditional on anything you do, Jesus poured out his blood for you. Let's celebrate communion together. Let me leave you with this. Jesus loves you. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Our job is very simple. It's just be the branch.
This is Danielle and her friend Marilyn, and Marilyn's been involved in Danielle's life for a while, and Danielle's been experiencing Mosaic on and off for a couple years now, but over the last year specifically, you've really made it a priority to be here. And the fun thing about Danielle is that she's a school counselor for high schools, and uh, she's a very empathetic person. She carries the burden of those students that she cares about. And when COVID hit, she saw brokenness, and she saw pain. And in that process of caring for other people, Danielle actually realized there was some brokenness and pain in her own life. And through Mosaic and through the community she had here, she's realized that Christ is the only one who can carry that burden, that she doesn't have to carry it herself. And so she's here to say, I'm all in following you, Jesus, because I know you can bring me rest. We're so excited for you, Danielle. Danielle, repeat after me. I believe Jesus is the Christ. I believe Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God. Son of the living God. My Lord and Savior. My Lord and Savior. Danielle, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right, and this is Corinne and her friend Grace, and they have been friends since high school. And Corinne's story is a really interesting one because she's had friends come into her life over the years who have really encouraged her to grow in her faith. But then the friendship would kind of wane or fall away, and then someone else would come along and get really excited about faith and then kind of wane and fall away again. But uh, with everything that's been going on in 2020, uh, Corinne got into an identity journey group, and she got study with a community that really kept her going and wouldn't let her falter. And that was going on simultaneously while Grace and her friend had been praying for Corinne for four years straight that she would come to faith and trust Jesus. And so when I talked to Corinne about what does it feel like in this moment, she says, I almost feel like relieved that this journey has, you know, kind of this restlessness had come to an end. But what we all know is that Corinne, this is just the beginning. This is the start of a new thing that God's gonna do in your life. And that's why, Grace, you said you're so excited for your friends. So Corinne, we couldn't be more proud of you. We're so happy you're here. We're so thankful for what God did through the identity journey, and we know this is just the beginning for what he's going to do in your life. So, Corinne, repeat after me. Say, I believe Jesus is the Christ. I believe Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God. Son of the living God. My Lord and Savior. My Lord and Savior. Okay, Corinne, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Wow, what an amazing worship experience. Hey guys, my name is Christian, and look, we have a powerful message to celebrate today, and that is that though there are a lot of scary things in the world today, we don't have a reason to be afraid because Jesus came and overcame the world by defeating death. And that is a great message. That message alone will change the world. But not if we don't go out and spread it and share it with people. And the most practical way that we do that is through 
Impact Week. That's right, it's that time of the year. And listen, I know some of you guys are new to Mosaic, you guys don't quite know what Impact Week is, so better than me explaining it to you, why don't I show you guys this video? We help people's practical needs so we can help their eternal needs. See, there's something bigger going on here than just walking. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he does lots of practical things to help people. He heals their sickness, he casts out demons, he makes the blind see, he raises the dead, but every time he strategically follows that up with communicating the bigger picture. So when he feeds 5,000 people a free lunch one day after a long day of teaching, it's the set up the next day, his boldest statement yet in his ministry where he says, I am the bread of life. Here we're helping uh, provide basic necessities. Our goal is to help others stretch their budget, hoping that they can help save some money and ultimately become self-sufficient. I know serving during Impact Week is impacting the lives of others. I've had people share with me that when they see us show up, they are reminded that there are people in the world that do actually love them. It's easier to have a conversation with people about Jesus when they know that you aren't there on your own agenda, that you have shown up to help serve them and love them, and the reason that you're serving is to share the hope of Jesus with them. And when we show people that we really do care about them, we help them be more open to grace and truth. Yes, what an amazing experience that was last year, and aren't you ready to do it again? Look, Mosaic, we're not gonna let COVID stop us from spreading the love of Jesus to the hurting people of Maryland, but your safety is our priority and we do care. So instead of wearing these t-shirts this year, we're gonna wear these amazing buffs. Keep you safe. That's right, get ready. So to get one of those buffs, make sure you stop by Mosaic at one of these two times. Also, if you're looking to sign up for an uh, Impact Week event, make sure you go to mosaicchristian.org slash IW20. It's gonna be a great time. So we'll see you again next week, Mosaic, and make sure you remember to be the branch.